Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing our call to worship, Sanctuary? Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Pleasant Hill. Uh, Brother Kenny and several of the men have gone fishing. Well, let's hope they can stop and find their way back home. If it was women, they would stop and ask. Men don't, so they may be over in Georgia somewhere. But anyway, uh, this morning we'd like to welcome to Pleasant Hill. And we've got a guest speaker who's going to fill in for Brother Kenny this morning, Mr. Heath Butler. He uh, normally is leading worship at the early service, so uh, we thank, we're thankful for his, uh, his obedience and faithfulness to come and share with us this morning. But uh, make sure you sign in the pew pads. Let us know if you're a member here and uh, just help us keep a record. But uh, anyway, we're going to start off with prayer concerns this morning. Anybody have someone they want prayed for or situation? How about it? I'm sorry? Stevie Burns, that's right. Heather and Matthew. Okay. Yes. I'd like for you to pray for my sister Becky. She's having a procedure uh, this coming week. So, anybody else? That's right. keeps it up he's gonna qualify to be a taxi driver or something he'd always hurt or something they have to move to New York City but uh, you know I, I want to praise God this morning you know uh, I had back surgery back in April and I'm telling you right now I got a lot of calls a lot of cards and a lot of prayer and uh, when I went back to work I was hoping that it wouldn't be too hard but uh, I had a big a big job waiting on me when I got back and let me tell you right now, if I was going to blow my back back out and mess myself up, it would have been the last six to seven weeks I've been back to work. But I work in Decatur, and I've been working on the drawbridge. And so every morning, for an hour, I would pray. You know, it's hard, it's, it's hard sometimes to humble yourself to pray for yourself. You know, we, we ask for prayer. Very, very few times does somebody say, I need your prayer. Well, you know what? I needed your prayer, and God answered my prayer, and I, I, I prayed to him every morning going to Decatur. I said, God, I need you today. You, you brought me, th you know, th this far. You brought me this far, and right now, I need you again today. Well, we finished that big job last Thursday. My back is held up. You know what? I mean, I had a fine doctor, but I really believe God guided his hand when he did my surgery. God is the one that's healed my back, and God is the one that has, has kept me where I'm at right now. So I praise God. Now, I'm thankful for that doctor, but I know it's, I was in the hands of God, and I appreciate your prayer. So anybody got anything else they want to share? Jeff, uh, Gail Milligan is going to have eye surgery in Franklin, Tennessee, on October 22nd. 
23rd. Uh, 23rd surgery, but she's got to be there on the 22nd for pre-op. And she needs somebody, someone to drive. She's got the vehicle, and so and she won't be able to drive. So if any of you can see yourselves to, uh, being able to do this, I'm sure she will certainly appreciate it very much. It's in Franklin, Tennessee. Okay. All right, nothing else. How about stand with me and we'll go to the garden prayer this morning. Oh, I'm sorry. Anybody else have an unspoken besides Rosemary? I do as well. Pray with me, would you? That's right. Our God still does miracles. The same power that came through the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost, we still have that Holy Spirit today. So just pray with me, and we'll pray in the Holy Spirit. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves before your throne. And Lord, may we have a heart of thanksgiving because you bless us each and every day. And Lord, we should be as excited about the blessings each and every day as we are about life itself. And so this morning we come to you and we just... Uh, we honor you and we worship you because you're so giving. You have forgiven us, you have covered us with grace, and you give us your love each and every day. And let us never take it for granted. And this morning, Lord, there have been some prayer concerns lifted, and Lord, we lift those to you and we lay them at the altar. And we, in faith, we ask for your will to be done, not our will, but yours. We do not ask because you can, we ask because we know that you will. And so this morning, I lift a, a group of men that represent this church, that the body of Christ here is missing a few because uh, they are, they're, they're in spirit. Lord, they are, they're, uh, they're being the body of Christ to one another. They're being brothers in Christ, and I hope that you bless them. But we ask for tra safe travel for them to return here to us. And so this morning, Lord, we just ask you to forgive us. We know that we fail you each and every day. We know that your grace and your mercy is sufficient. And Lord, no matter how many times we fail you, you're always there. And so we come to you now. We ask that you continue to bless this place called Pleasant Hill. May your hand be upon it. May we be a biblical church. May we stand upon the word, the truth. And Lord, may the Spirit guide us. And so this morning we give thanks for all these things. And we lift this prayer to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sing with us.
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
as the choir comes down. We're going to ask Heath Butler to come up. Uh, I don't even know where Heath's originally from. He's a foreigner. He's from the other side of the river, I believe. But uh, Heath has been uh, very dedicated to the early service. He uh, is very gifted as a musician. Sings pretty good. <laughs> but he's got a beautiful family. And, uh, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody of not uh, really extending my, my hand out and saying, you know, Heath, tell me a little bit about yourself. And so maybe this morning he'll introduce <laughs> himself a little bit, let us know where he comes from, and uh, share his life with us. So this morning, let's, uh, <laughs> let's just welcome Heath Butler with a big <laughs> amen. Amen? Bring it on, brother. Thank you, Skip. Come on. Appreciate it. <clears throat> I live on the other side of the river but I grew up on this side, so that should make you feel a little better. And if you knew that Kenny and the, the other guys were going to be out of town, you probably wouldn't have been here, but I'm glad you didn't know that, and you're here, so it's good to see you. Um, I will tell you a little bit about growing up. Uh, matter of fact, uh, well, when I was a kid, um, we, and, th and this is going to tell a little bit of my age, a little bit. I'm not, not too terribly old, but I remember well, growing up my, um, on the weekends sometimes, you know, we didn't have DVD players and even DVR where we can record everything. We, we used to actually go to the video store and rent a video, and we didn't even have a VCR at home, so we got to rent the VCR too. Did anybody ever do that? Do you remember doing that? It was the pop top thing, and uh, sometimes the, it wouldn't actually stick down. So, you, oh, let's put the candle on there, you know, stick it down uh, and watch your movies. And we'd always get, um, we get to get three movies. So we got the VCR, we get three movies. I got to pick one, mom and dad pick one, and my sister got to pick one. And uh, mom and dad always got, like, maybe the Return to Snowy River, is that, a, is that a thing? Yeah, all right, they watched that, all right. I was good with that. Uh, it, was, it was pretty fun. Uh, my sister would always get a cartoon like Care Bears, and uh, when I was about six, I would always get something fun like G.I. Joe or Transformers or some, some action figure type cartoon. And, and this one time, I got the Lone Ranger cartoon. I don't know if you guys ever watched the Lone Ranger cartoon. It was great. And, uh, of course, growing up, uh, I had the, had the mask, and I had the little guns and everything. And my grandparents had horses. This is perfect for me. Uh, one weekend, we, we'd go and rent the VCR. we get the videos. I'm watching The Lone Ranger, and we go to my grandparents' house on Sunday afternoon to hang out. And they've got a couple of ponies. And they say, hey, you guys want to ride these ponies around the yard? Now, these were the ponies that um, I'm pretty sure they came from. Uh, did you ever go to Uncle Charlie's flea market? Did you ever go out there? I'm pretty sure they came from there because these were the ponies that all they would do, literally, they would they walk around in a circle. You didn't have to time to anything anymore. They'd walked around so many times in a circle, you could stick a kid on it, let them go. They'd never go anywhere. They just, uh, right? So there was a white one. Of course, I chose that one because the Lone Ranger's horse is named Silver. It was white. So here I am with my white horse, my mask, my guns. I am the Lone Ranger. And we're riding around the yard. Now, my sister was younger than me, so they were, everybody was watching her. They were holding her up on the horse, making sure she didn't fall off. They just let me on the horse, and I took off. So we're riding around the yard, and you got to remember, I just watched the Lone Ranger cartoon, and in the cartoon, the Lone Ranger had come up on a couple of bad guys. He was trying to get them, so he's chasing them on his horse, and he gets up to a railroad track, and they've got the, the hook that comes out so they can put the mailbag on it. So he jumps up and grabs hold of that mailbag hook, and he swings around, and he lands on the horse of the bad guy, and he gets him, and he saves the day. And we're riding around my grandparents' yard, and I'm watching, and there's this tree limb that's just sticking out. I'm like, huh, okay. And I raise my arms up. Yep. And we get to it, and I reach it. And the horse keeps going. Now I'm hanging on, and finally he comes out from under me, and I'm just hanging there. Well, that's as far ahead as I thought. I didn't really think past that point. I just thought, hey, this is cool. I got this. I got it. And I'm hanging there on this limb. And I don't know if you've ever tried to scream or yell for help if you've been hanging on a limb like that. You can't really do it. It's like, help. It just, you just can't, you can't get enough breath to, to make it. So I'm hanging there. I'm like, what am I going to do? And I don't know about you, but you've probably had those moments in your life too where you have said, I got this. Now, your moment may have actually started out with you saying, hey, y'all, watch this. It's the same thing, okay? <laughs> I got this. I, I'm in control here. I know what's going on. Uh, this is going to be good because I said it's going to be good. And we end up out on a limb needing some help. And, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, we, we've all had those I got this moments. And 
We're going all the way back to Genesis this morning, so if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Genesis chapter 2. I think this is one of the biggest deceptions that we face, and we... It's nothing new. We faced it for a long time. Uh, As a matter of fact, it's something that came up in the Garden of Eden. This this deception that we are in control and we should be in control. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 uh, says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, God has already, He's created the heavens and the earth. He's just created Adam. He hadn't created Eve yet. He's just created Adam. And he's put him in this garden and he goes, here you go. You got this. Just don't eat of that tree. All right? Everything else, you're good. Everything's perfect. We're all good here. You just don't eat it from that and we're all okay. Right? Fast forward to chapter 3 and it says this in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will surely not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil was basically saying to to, to Adam and Eve, Hey, you do what you want. You can be in control and that will be good. You know, the Bible tells us that just what we read in Genesis, there's a way that seems right to man, but at the end that leads to death. God said, don't eat this of this tree or you will surely die. And we did it anyway. And of course, that created death for everyone because uh, through that, sin entered into our world. The lie that we can be in control um, really makes it hard for us. It says that it's the best place for us to be, that we know best about how we're going to control our own life, that we make our own choices, that we direct our, our lives and my decisions are good. And that lie has been around since then. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Our, our selfish pride of hanging on to our power, our control, leads to death spiritually. Sometimes physically, but, but spiritually it leads to death. Um, God has given us instructions for how to live. And he's told us, rely on me, but we still choose not to. Uh, So that's the problem this morning that we all face. We all have those moments where we say, I've got this. It's all going to be good. But in the end, it only ends up leading to death. Um, So what do we do about that problem? Because that's been a problem that's been around for a long time. It's a problem that you and I face every day. Um, As believers, we face it. Um, You know, even as unbelievers, before you come to, to knowledge of Christ, you face that. Because the way that you've always lived leads to death. But following Christ is what leads to life. And so, uh, as we are, even as we are Christians, we face this same choice every day. And so, let's read what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. Um, this theme of life and death and living by the Spirit, Paul actually talks about in Galatians and uh, Ephesians and Colossians. It, it's woven throughout, and really even, even Philippians to some extent, it's woven throughout those four books. And this is what he says about it. Verses uh, 16 through, through 25. in in chapter 5 of Galatians says so I say live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature for the sinful nature desires contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature they're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want but if you're led by the spirit you're not under the law he goes on to talk about what actually the sinful nature look like he says they're obvious it's sexual immorality impurity debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. He goes on and on and on and on and on. And he says, like I told you, if you live by this, it leads to death. In verse 22, he contrasts that and says, but this is what the fruit of the Spirit are. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, self-control. Against such things... There is no law. It is those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. When you come to know Christ, this miracle happens in your life. The Bible tells us that when you surrender and put your, your faith in Christ, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. That we are given 
Christ's own spirit in us. Now, the problem is, and, and uh, Kenny's dad actually talked about this a couple months ago when he was here. The problem is that old man is still there too. <laughs> and those two things are at constant conflict with each other. They're always fighting to get control and to be in control of our lives. And the spirit gives us life. But that old man and its ways lead to death. Um, if we just compare those two things, the list from uh, what the old man gives us and what the Spirit gives us, we would all say, well, obviously love and joy and peace and patience, all those things are way better than what we had. It's obvious, but why do we continue to choose the old way? His, his Word tells us that because we are in Christ, that old life with its passions and desires, should have been crucified with Christ. And we should live by the Spirit to keep us in step with the Spirit. Now, when we talk about the Spirit um, leading us and, and, and guiding our lives, you know, the, the Word says that the Spirit reminds us of all the truth that Christ has taught us. So when we need to know what that truth is, it reminds us. His Spirit leads us and tells us this is what you're supposed to do. But we make those choices every day uh, that we say, I know that seems right. I know your spirits lead me to do this, but I got this. I'm going to do it my way. And that only ends up leading to death. It leads to um, those sinful things that Paul talks about in chapter 5. So, so what do we do? How do we remedy that situation? Well, Christ is in us. His spirit is in us. But we've got to choose who's in control. We, we've got to choose... Who's going to control our life for that day? Is it going to be Christ? Are we going to surrender and submit to Him? Or are we going to go with what the old man said? Um, surrender is scary. It basically says that we are not in control. I don't know about you. I like to be in control. If we're driving anywhere, my wife can tell you, she usually just gets over the passenger seat because she knows I want to drive <laughs> and be in control. I like to have that control. Um, we, we constantly strive for that, right? But surrender to Christ says... I'm not in control, and you know best. You know, this word says in Isaiah that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I mean, think about this. This is, this is the person, God, who created the world through a word, who created all this complexity by speaking it. And we say, no, God, we got it. How crazy is that, right? I mean, we, we, don't, we don't take into account what he's done. But it takes humility to surrender to Him every day. Not, not just once, but every day. To say, today I'm going to follow your Spirit. I'm going to live for you. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we do that, a couple things happen. One, um, we trade that meager power that we have of being able to control our lives for a bigger power that He has. We're trading those in. I, I think of the story of, of Esau and Jacob. Uh, you guys probably remember this. Esau comes in uh, from, from hunting, and he is so hungry. He's the firstborn son, so he gets uh, the, the best inheritance out of, out of all his family. He gets the best inheritance because he's the firstborn. But he comes in, and he's so hungry uh, that Jacob says, well, I'll give you this bowl of soup if you give me your birthright. And Jacob trades in his entire future, his entire inheritance for a bowl of soup. We do that. We do that. Christ has given us the key to abundant life, and we trade it in for a bowl of soup. We trade it in for something that leads to death. I love steak. <laughs> I could eat steak. I hope I eat a steak for lunch today. Uh, <laughs> um, like, I, I could eat steak. If I had the choice of just about anything in the world to eat, I would eat steak. Um, I love Riccatoni steak. I don't know if y'all have ever had it there. He makes a great steak. It, it's, they do it in this wood fire grill, and it's just got a good flavor to it. Now, if I had the choice to eat that, or to eat a bowl of Campbell's soup from, from the house, I'm going to choose the steak every time. Why do, why do we do this with God, though? God says, hey, I've laid out before you a couple things you can do. If you do this, you're going to have an abundant life. Or you can keep doing it this way. You can have this steak, or you can eat this bowl of soup. Which are you going to choose? Why don't we go back to the soup? Why do we do that? We, we continually choose to do it our own way instead of doing it God's way. Um, his weakness is infinitely more than our strength. He tells us in his word that he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Um, that, that He doesn't do things like we do. As a matter of fact, he does things 
a lot of times the opposite of what we would do. Uh, a great theologian once said, if my natural instinct is always wrong, then surely the opposite must be right. That, that great theologian was George Costanza from Seinfeld. I don't know if you guys ever watched that show. He had an episode where he said that, and it was called The Opposite, and basically he decided that this whole, his whole life, he's always been doing things how he wants to do it, and it's obviously not worked out well. So one day he says, I'm just going to, whatever I think I should do, I'm going to do the opposite of that. He ends up getting a job with the New York Yankees. It's just kind of this crazy thing. Anyway, we do that same thing. If, if our natural instinct is wrong, then the opposite surely must be right. And, and God gives us those opposites in our lives to follow and to do. You know, the, I think about the Sermon on the Mount. You know, in there, Jesus is talking about all these different things. He says, you've heard it said this. I tell you that. You've heard it this way. I tell you this way. He says, you've heard, hate your enemies. I say, love your enemies. It's the opposite of what we think it should be. It doesn't make sense. But his ways are higher than our ways. And so we should follow him and, and live for him. So does that mean it's easy? No. Does it mean it's not scary? No. Most of the time it is. But our reliance on the Holy Spirit leads us to life. So don't hold on to that is, which is fading away. Um, when Christ has something that lasts forever that you can take hold of. Uh, when I traveled a lot leading worship and speaking, I, would, uh, I did a lot of mission trips. And in those, those trips, uh, I was usually really tired by the time I got home. And a lot of times I'd have to fly out somewhere and fly back home. And if I was on a seven-day trip, I mean, by day seven, I'm just I'm flat worn out. And... Um, all I wanted was on the way home to have a quiet, easy flight, to not have to talk to anybody else, to just relax, maybe catch a nap, get home and get a Subway sandwich a foot long and sit on my couch and catch up on Sports Center. That's what I wanted to do, right? I didn't, I didn't want anything, anything more than that. And it never failed. Almost every return flight home, I would get on the plane and somebody would sit down beside me and I'd get this nudge from the Holy Spirit, you need to talk to them. You, you, need to, you need to share something with them. I was like, oh. I remember one flight. I come back, and it was a lot of turbulence um, on the way out from where we were. And uh, the girl that was sitting beside me had had an ear infection. It still wasn't healed up right. And so all the pressure and stuff from the altitude changes and the cabin pressure was just, she was in a lot of pain. And the, uh, the flight attendants were coming back, and they were trying to help her out and trying to give her, you know, Tylenol or something just to dull the pain and, and she was just obviously hurting and, and just not in a good spot and here I am on the back of this plane I'm exhausted and I'm sitting next to this girl and, and the whole time I'm thinking okay God um, please don't tell me to talk to her <laughs> she, she, has, she has enough going on she's hurting she doesn't, she doesn't need to talk she doesn't need to hear from me I, I'm going to have to yell anyway because it's so loud in this plane and sure enough a little nudge. You need to talk to her. And the conversation usually started out like this on the plane. It was, yeah, where are you coming from? Where are you going? What do you do? And when I got to the what do you do part, I couldn't hide it anymore. When you say, well, I'm a traveling worship leader, well, you got a lot of explaining to do because a lot of people don't understand how that works. And so this girl, she ended up uh, telling me that she was raised Catholic. And so we had this interesting conversation about, about church and about the differences and, and Catholicism and Protestant religion and just the way things went and and we started talking about the word and she started asking questions like well what does the Bible say about this or that and I was like well you know you can you can read it for yourself do you have a Bible and, and she's like no I don't you know uh, but you know I, well, I've got one at home it's an old one that I got when I was a baby uh, you know it's just the New Testament I've got that but I don't have a Bible that I read you know she's like how do I know what the what the pastor, or the preacher, or the priest is telling me is true. I was like, well, you just test it against the Word. You read it. You, you find out if what he's saying matches up with the Scripture. You don't have to have somebody read it to you. You can do it yourself. You know? And so I say, well, when you get home, you should, you, know, you should pick one up. Go to a store and pick up a Bible and read that. And try, just start in John. Just check, check it out there. You know? And so I thought, okay, good. I've done my deal. That's the end of that. And so we get quiet again, and then I get this other nudge. Give her your Bible. Man, I just got this Bible. I, you know, like I've, it's got the cool cover and it's, it's it's thin and I, you know, like when I'm traveling, it's easy to put in my backpack and it's got all my notes in it and I, oh, you know, I try to put it off and 
give her your Bible. So I, I go, hey, if, I, um, if you had a Bible, would you read it? She's like, yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to give you mine so you don't have to go buy one. And so I reached down, I got my Bible out, and it, I could tell it made a huge impact on her life. I don't know what happened to her after that. I don't know if she read it or not, but she was cer certainly thankful that she had it. And I had peace, which is a fruit of the Spirit, because I did what God led me to do. I followed Him instead of following my own way. And you can probably think of examples in your life where God has told you to do the same thing. Maybe it was buying somebody's food at a restaurant or holding the door open for somebody or just going to visit somebody or give them a call, even when you thought of maybe bothering them or whatever. But you did it to be an encouragement. That's giving life. That's obeying the Spirit. And that makes a difference in people's lives and it makes a difference in your life. And so this morning, I just want to challenge you that we have that choice every day how we're going to live and who we're going to submit to. Are we going to submit to the old man whose ways lead to death? Or are we going to submit to the Spirit and how He leads us into life? Which are we going to choose this morning? Um, I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what all you have going on. Uh, I know that this is a lot of times easier said than done uh, to live by the Spirit. But I just want to challenge you this morning to do that. It's when you get up every day saying this, God, what do you have for me today? How should I handle this? Because we're going to come into situations where we can, we can mess it up or we can let Christ work in it and produce a good fruit and good life. And we need that. We need to rely on Him every day. He's given us that spirit as a guide and as a reminder of what His truth says. So I want to challenge you just to surrender uh, your life to Him every day. And then sometimes that's hard, but we can do it. So if you will, let's bow in prayer. And I'll ask our musicians, musicians to come back around and, and we'll close things out. But let's, let's bow as we pray. God, we thank you so much this morning for your spirit. We thank you for the love that you have for us. God, we thank you that uh, you give us everyday choices that we can make. God, to follow you or to do our own thing. And God, I just pray that you give us the strength to choose your way, even when it doesn't seem to make sense to us, when maybe it doesn't make sense to those around us. God, even when we face opposition in doing that, God, I just pray that you give us the, the strength and the courage, God, to follow through on what we know your word tells us to do. God, I thank you for this group of people. God, I thank you for their heart for you. God, if there's one here this morning that has never given their life to you, Lord, I just pray that uh, today you would draw them to yourself. God, that you would let them choose life this morning. God, be with us now as we uh, leave this place. God, continue to guide us by your Spirit. Help us to be responsive. Help us to know your voice and to know your word so that we can live it out. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our musicians would come around. Uh, the altar is open if you'd like to pray. If you'll stand with us, uh, we will sing our invitation song.